I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. That's where the listing of the fruit of the Spirit is found. And then we'll spend a little time at the beginning on that, a little time at the end on a different part of that same chapter in Galatians, uh, or the next chapter in Galatians. So we'll have some things for you to, to explore. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you, there are pew Bibles. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, uh, then take one of those with you. Take it with you as you go so that you'll have... Uh, copy to read on your own. Now, we're in a series about the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is the outward manifestation of the inner working of God in a heart. So what happens on the outside is because of some things God's doing on the inside of us. So that's the key part when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, last week, Rhonda and I traveled, uh, we did a lot of traveling inside Peru, and as we went across the countryside several times because see I'm a thinking guy I said those are bananas and they're hanging on a tree I'm just thinking that may be a banana tree see I could be a, I could be a detective with that kind of skill right if I see bananas hanging on a tree it's probably a banana tree and here's the rest of that when I see the fruit of the Spirit showing up, spilling out in somebody's life, I say, that's one of those Jesus people. That's a follower of Christ, because followers of Christ, it starts showing up. Now, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, you can't pick and choose. There are nine of these things listed here, and we're working our way through. And you look at this list, and you can't say, okay, joy, I like that. Give me a double portion of joy. Patience, I'll pass on that because I have no patience with that idea. Well, it's all these things, all these things, taking a step, moving forward, growing, maturing, becoming more evident in our lives as day goes by. That's what it means, fruit of the Spirit. Now, the Bible says, this is the list from Galatians 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Jimmy talked about kindness last week, goodness, Today's uh, topic, faithfulness, we'll talk about next week from Lamentations, gentleness, and self-control. And then Paul just summarized, and against such things there is no law. Nobody's against this stuff. It's a, gr it's, a great, it's a great expression of how much God loves us being demonstrated through the lives of his people in this world. Now, we tend to lump people together into categories of good or bad, and we evaluate, and we say, well, this person's good, this person's bad. In any number of ways. In fact, if I started throwing out names of famous people, here's what would happen. Some of you would say, oh, that's a good person. And some of you with the same person would say, no, that's a bad person. Because good and bad is kind of complicated. We would say, good at sports, bad at life. You see how that goes. You say, good at business, bad at family. You say, good at church, but when you feel like nobody's watching, maybe more bad is going on behind the scenes. So goodness isn't as clear-cut as we might think. What makes a person good or bad? The first time the, the word good shows up in the Bible is the first, first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. Uh, God is speaking the world into existence by his spoken word. Where there was nothing, there is something because God in his creative power speaks and he and it, as it goes through he says and it was good and he creates something else and he said it was good it was good but there's a day that came that God said it's not good that the man should be alone and so God comes to Adam and he says to him Adam I have a gift for you I'm going to make for you a wife and I want to tell you about her she's going to be beautiful Every day and all the time, she's going to be beautiful. And I want to tell you a little bit about how she's going to do things. When, when you come home from tending that Garden of Eden at the end of the day, she's going to meet you at the door with a big smile, all dressed to the hilt, big smile on her face. She's going to say, oh, my dear husband Adam, come in. You're your recliner is awaiting you. And there's 
a big glass of sweet tea next to that recliner. And I have your slippers, but before I put those on, of course, I want to massage your feet because I know it's been a hard day. And I, I, want, to, I want to give you a shoulder massage too. And here's, here's the remote control. Watch whatever you want. I really want you to be in control of this all the time. And, and Adam, just know this. I'm, I'm never going to complain. I'm never going to nag. I'm always going to be championing your cause. And Adam says to God, well, that sounds pretty good. Uh, what's that going to cost me? God said, well, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And he said, well, what can I get for just a rib? And <laughs> in the... Well, it didn't quite happen that way. But, <laughs> but God put... He, he put Adam to sleep, and he took a spare rib, and he made some wonderful prime rib out of it. And he brought the woman to the man. And you remember, the original Hebrew, it says, this is, this is uh, Adam's response. When God brought the woman to the man, the man said, hamala, 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 hamala. That's what it says in Hebrew. The, the English translation is, he said, whoa, man! And... And thus she was named. Whoa, man. I've been in Peru for way too long. Uh, the elevation has uh, affected my mental capacities. Yeah, so God looked at all that he created. And he said, it is very, very good. So we're talking about goodness today. There are three statements I want to start out with. When we think about the, the spiritual fruit of goodness. Here's the first one. I want to be good. Most people, really, we, we want to be good. We desire to be good. It's our inclination that we would be good. But goodness is a word that, and good, it's just a weak word in uh, English vocabulary. Here's some of the ways we use it. We say, good morning, have a good day, good night, good job, good game, good luck, good luck with that, good move, good hair day, good to know, good to go. Good looking, looking good. The good life, good clean fun. Good idea, good to see you. It's all good, feeling good, looks good to me. Ooh, that's not good. So far, so good. It's too good to be true. A good time was had by all. Are you good with that? I'm good with that. You good and ready? Smell this, is this milk good? I feel good for good measure, good riddance. It does my heart good. Your guess is as good as mine. It's for your own good. And if you got all that, well, good for you, okay? Now, wanting to be good is a worthy goal, for sure, for sure. George Orwell wrote this about goodness. He said, on the whole, human beings want to be good, but not too good, and not quite all the time. I think he nailed that. That reminds me of a story about a little boy who prayed, dear God, make me good, but not too good, just good enough I don't get a spanking. We're going to start with the definition of goodness. And again, we could spend a long time and create a very complex picture of goodness. But as a simple definition, a simple way to think about this, we'll think about it this way. Goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. And it has to be both things. It can't be one. You have to do the right thing for the right reason. There's some guys in the Bible called the Pharisees. They're religious leaders in Jesus' day. But Jesus challenged them in multiple fronts they did the right things for the wrong reasons often. One of the examples, Jesus said, you guys, you love to give money to the poor. That's a good thing. The poor are all around us. We should care for the poor. The Bible says a lot about poor. Some are in a couple thousand verses in the Bible talk about caring for the poor. But he said, when you do it, you do it like this. You say, I'm giving money for the poor. Waving my bill above my head so everybody knows what a wonderful person and how generous I am. Look at me. Look how much I care. Look how wonderful and warm and personable and grace-filled I am giving money to the poor. And he said, when you do that, you're, you're doing it to be recognized by other people. You're not doing it because you genuinely care for the poor. You want other people to think you're a great guy. You're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Uh, being in church, well, the Bible says it is good to get together with God's people. 
And yet, some people, they can get together at church. And I go to church because it's a good place to make business contacts, a good place to do some networking, because I want people to think I have it all together, whether I do or not. I'm going to put on a front that if I'm in church, people will think good things about me and that I'm a good person. Right thing, wrong reason. The Bible is really the good book, and it has a lot to say about what it means to be good, to not only do the right thing, but do the right thing for the right reason. Now, goodness is something God defines, and this is one place where we think about uh, another definition of good. You don't have to wonder what good is. God gives three guidelines. There's a prophet called Micah. He's a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. He's an 8th century B.C. prophet. And Micah, here's how he throws it out. He says, he has, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? And here's what he says. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Now, to do, to do justice means that you walk with integrity, with honesty, with, uh, with fairness. Some people say yeah, honesty is the best policy. When you're a follower of Jesus Christ, honesty is not the best policy. It's the policy. It's the only policy. There aren't other policies. Loving kindness means showing kindness to those who most need kindness. Uh, some, of the, some of the meaning that in uh, translation of that, that, that word means unexpected kindness. Nobody's paying you back for this. There, there's no, uh, I'll do this and you do this back for me. It is selfless and sacrificial, unexpected kindness. Last week, uh, talked about kindness. Kindness isn't being kind to someone who can repay you for it. That's just a transaction. It is selflessness. No way of repaying your kindness. So justice and kindness are, are key parts of goodness because it, communicates this is how you relate to other people this is how you relate to to your your circles of influence your family your friends your co-workers all that stuff but he saves the big one for last the best good you can do is to walk humbly with your god now think about that uh how do you approach god well, if you were approaching some uh king in the ancient world you didn't just come kicking the door and saying, hey, I'm here, and here's what you need to do for me. Uh, you approached with great humility, with uh, your, your head bowed. You waited for the king to invite you in. Uh, there, there are all kinds of rules that you followed, protocols that needed to be in place. And, and think about our relationship to God. Often when we, and sometimes in desperation, we cry out to God. And, well, there are those times in my life, times for all of us, but as a general rule, when you approach God, you don't go to God and say, God, here are all the places you're falling down the job right now. Here are all the places you're coming up short. You, you need to take care of this and take care of this and take care of this because I'm pretty sure I know how to run the universe and you're not doing very well right now, so I'm going to give you some pointers and I'm going to check back in with you to measure your success and see how you're doing in the days ahead. A great deal of pridefulness in how we approach God. The Bible talks about enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with, with praise, that when you're approaching God, you, you come in with a thankful heart because you recognize every good and perfect gift comes from God. I wouldn't have much anything if it wasn't for him. And so I'm going to come with, with some humility. I'm going to enter his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. When I come before the Lord, I, 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 I want to begin with a whole lot of thanks and a whole lot of, God, here's who you are. Here, here, here's what you're about. It, Celebrate his character, uh, his qualities, his, his essence as God. and Celebrate those things. With humility, we approach God. Walk humbly then with him, recognizing he is God and I am, am not. And there's a promise, a great promise in the Bible. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. At the proper time, he may exalt you. When you approach him with humility, he lifts you up. He gives you opportunity. He, he directs when it's time to maybe take a step into the spotlight even. So based on God's three guidelines of goodness, you say, how good you doing? And most people, even in response at this point, most people will say, I think I'm pretty good. Which makes the second point really important for us. 
I can't be good. I want to be good, but I can't be good. And you can't be good. Here's what I mean. We think we're good because we compare ourselves with other people, don't we? We look around us at our friends and our family and uh, neighbors, and we look at them and we say, I may not have it all together, but I'm a step ahead of that knucklehead. I'm doing better than they are. You're looking up and down your rows thinking about it now. I'm better than most of these people. I'm good compared to other people. But the standard that God's, God holds for us is not, how do I compare with other people who are sin-struck strugglers? The standard is a perfect God. The standard is Jesus Christ who always was good. Now, that, uh, that's going to thin the crowd. God's perfect standard of goodness is complete holiness, perfection. And if you use the wrong standard for your comparison, you're going to end up at the wrong spot when it comes to how am I doing in relationship to goodness? There's a story I heard a long time ago. It came to mind as I was uh, pulling, on, pulling these things together. It, it's a story about two brothers, and uh, we'll call them uh, Bob and old Tom. They lived in a small town and really were in, they owned about half the town. They controlled the rest of the town. They were, they were all that in this town, and they were terrible, terrible people. Just, just mean, uh, dishonest, devious, liars, cheats, and thieves. And they never darkened the door of the church. But here's what happened. Old Tom died. And when old Tom died, the older of the two brothers, Bob approached the Baptist preacher in town and said, hey, I want you to preach, ser- preach a funeral service from, from my brother, old Tom. And the preacher said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm glad to help. I'm sorry you lost your brother, and I'll be glad to preach a service. He said, but, but there's one thing I want you to do. I want you to say somewhere in that service, I want you to say, Old Tom was a saint. He said, oh my goodness, I can't do that. Everybody in town knows what, what a mean-spirited, wicked man he was. There's no way I can say that. He said, I'll tell you what. If somewhere in your service you'll say, Old Tom was a saint, I'll give, give $10,000 toward your church building program. The pastor said, I just, I just don't know. That's, that's going to be such a stretch. Everybody in town knows him. Well, he came today for this funeral service and Place was packed out. Partly they were just celebrating. Old Tom was gone. One down, one to go. But they're also really curious. Now, how's a pastor, how, how's he going to talk about this guy at the memorial service? Well, the pastor got up and, and he shared. and He said, folks, you all know old Tom. Most of you have been around him most of your lives. And you know he was one of the most mean-spirited, wicked men that ever walked the face of the earth. He, he never had any time for God. You know that he was a drunkard. He was a liar, mean as a snake. But he pointed to his brother Bob and he said, but you know what? Compared to his brother, Bob, (laughs) that man was a saint. (laughs) Oh, anyway. Most people people think, I'm pretty good. But I don't want you to miss what Jesus said. He said, this is from the Sermon on the Mount. You, therefore, must be perfect. Perfect. Oh, my. As your heavenly Father is perfect. Some people can be good most of the time. Most people can be good some of the time. But none of us can be perfectly good all the time. So you start talking about uh, how good you are. Oh, my. Listen to these words. This is the Apostle Paul from Romans, a couple different places in Romans. All have turned aside, he says. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out. I think, man, I think I can relate to that guy. I feel that, I feel that tug of war in my spirit every day in multiple levels. I think all of us desire to do good, to be good, 
But we have this anchor called the sin nature that we're dragging along and it's going to drag us down and we're going to fall short of the glory of God. We're going to come up uh, missing some things. You're never going to find true forgiveness and goodness until you admit you do not have the capacity to do good. You know, the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Man, that's, that's when, when, when some, if someone ever gives you the advice, just follow your heart. That is really bad advice because your heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart will lie to you because that sin nature in you. You don't want to follow your heart. You want to follow Jesus Christ. He'll lead you in the right places. Now, we might feel the way Paul did. This is uh, catching some more, another verse out of that Romans 7. Oh, I relate to this. And this is Paul. Paul's, Paul's a spiritual guy. You think, Paul's got it going. By the time he writes Romans, he's at a high level of spiritual maturity. And yet, here's how he describes his own life at that point. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I keep doing the dumb stuff that I know better, and yet I do it anyway. Many of us are in denial about this truth in our lives. We make all kinds of excuses. Well, I can rationalize this. I can justify some behavior. Listen, you can't, you can't be saved. You can't come into a relationship to God, have your sin forgiven, and know you're going to heaven one of these days when you die until you realize you cannot do this by yourself. You cannot earn your way, deserve your way to heaven. You can't live the Christian life and be good by yourself. It's only through the Holy Spirit in you. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a fruit of my good intentions or my strong spiritual disciplines. It is Jesus in me in the power of the Holy Spirit. Third thing. Jesus is good for me, and Jesus is good in me. In Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he says, remember how he approached Jesus? Good teacher. Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And you remember Jesus' response. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Jesus didn't tell him, don't call me good. But Jesus is connecting some dots for him that are really uh, important, some things that he really needs to understand. Jesus is good because Jesus is God. Now, the Bible affirms many times, God is good when? That was pretty good for you guys. Usually our unison isn't that, isn't, uh, that well done. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. That's the nature of God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And uh, also in the Psalms, oh, give, I, I say the Psalms, this shows up in the books of the law. It shows up in the books of history. It shows up in the prophets. This statement's just a mantra. They throw out over and over and over again. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. He is good. When you come to Christ, Jesus takes residence in your heart, the presence of the person of the Holy Spirit, and you have access to the divine goodness, not your goodness. As I, as the personality of Jesus comes to reside in me, uh, my personality comes to exhibit the characteristics of Christ, and one of those is going to be goodness. It's going to overflow in my life. It's going to, uh, in the uh, 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. My cup overflows. When Jesus is elevated in your heart, it begins to overflow in the fruit of the Spirit. And one of those is going to be goodness to the people around you. You hear people say, uh, oh, at memorial services, funeral services, she's a good man. She's a good woman. How do you define good? One of my favorite guys that's called good in the Bible is a guy named Barnabas in the book of Acts. Bar son of encouragement. Well, he's a He's the kind of guy you just want in your life. Son of encouragement, Barnabas. And this is what it says about Barnabas when he's introduced to us. It says, he was a good man. That's awesome. And here's why he was good. Full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Full of the, when you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're full of faith, that's going to make you a good man. That'll make you a good woman. And that, those aren't separate descriptions. They're connected. He was a good man because he's full of the Holy Spirit. And we said a few weeks ago, 
the way the fruit of the Spirit grows in you is you, you're really connected to God. That Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Here's the trunk of the tree. Here's a branch on the tree. If my arm is cut off, it's not going to be much use. It's not going to live very long. It's not going to be productive. It's productive and it, it, it's helpful to me as long as it's connected to the rest of my body. And when it comes to us, we as a branch connected to Christ as the trunk, the, the vine. Spiritual life flows through us and we become fruitful. The fruit of the Spirit comes to be exhibited in us. Now, good works, doing good. We'll talk about this a little bit at the very end too. Good works are not the root of salvation. You're not saved. Your sin doesn't go away because of the good you do. Good works are not the root of salvation. Good in us, spilling over into our world, is the fruit of salvation because we are saved. Now, as we're landing this thing, I want to give you some practical things to consider as you seek to do good and overflow with goodness. And this from uh, Galatians chapter, chapter 6. So uh, one chapter over, just a few verses from where we are with the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to share these things because we want to do good and overflow with goodness because that's what God desires. For, for his followers, what he wants, his will for us. So God wrote to the church, or Paul wrote to the church at Galatia. This is in God's word. It says, and let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap, there's going to be a harvest, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As we finish up, I want to, I want to break the, those verses out. Now Paul wrote also to the Thessalonians, as for you brothers, do not grow weary in doing good, which means you can grow weary in doing good because he wouldn't have said it in a word if it wasn't a possibility. Here's what we learn. Four quick things. Goodness is hard work. It's going to require effort. It's going to require energy. It's going to require time. And here's what happens. It's going to be labor intensive because we live in this broken world and it's a sin-filled world and we're we are trying to overcome that. We said uh, a few weeks ago, peace is the inner fruit of the Spirit that sustains us in times of trouble. Goodness, we could say, is action taking, taken in the world of trouble. It requires engaging time and energy. Goodness drains your spirit. Abiding in Christ renews your spirit. Uh, remember the story of Jesus? He's in a crowd. A woman just says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I could be healed. With a great step of faith, she reaches out. People all around, but Jesus says, somebody touch me. The disciples say, everybody's touching you. He said, no, somebody, somebody special touched me because I felt, I felt power go out from me. Power gets spiritual power gets depleted and it has to be renewed. The reservoir of, of spiritual strength, doing good and all the right things is going to deplete spiritual power. It has to be renewed by being connected to God's word and prayer and God's people. Or else uh, we're going to do all the exhaling and no inhaling to renew. And as a result, that's where spiritual burnout takes place and where sin can prey upon us. And then goodness... Think about this as the hard work. It's a never-ending calling in the world. There's always another need. There's always another person. There's always a, another note to write or visit to make. And it's just a tall mountain to climb. And you can grow weary and you can grow discouraged. As, as we, we covered big chunks of uh, Peru last week, oh, good, and I, I say, I'll back that up and say, oh, right here at home, you guys have been so, so very generous. Close to $30,000 you've given to a couple of different causes to help with disaster relief. And then we've sent a lot of people from here to go to the affected areas and to minister and to care. I'm so proud of you for that. We spent time in Peru, and the last place where we stopped, we went to the church and the community. It's an impoverished community. They'd experienced flooding several months ago. And the river had gone higher than it had ever gone. It was their 100-year flood. But, man, I, I look at the landscape, and the, the homes are 
are sticks and bamboo with mud packed in between the sticks and you run four to ten feet of water through that neighborhood where there's no, there's no safety net for those people. They're, they're, they're so far out from everything. If compassion didn't have a touch at that church, uh, the whole community would have just starved to death over the last several months because they lost all their crops. Uh, and, and I walk through those streets and I think, oh my, you get, you get compassion fatigue. Because there's so much, and the needs are so great in the world, and the hurts so many, and we can become weary in doing good. The second thing is that goodness will yield a harvest. And I'm going to add to that eventually. It'll yield yield a harvest. I could go out, and I could bust up some dirt in my backyard, and I could plant a fall garden, get, get get all the weeds out, and get all my rows set up, and plant my seeds, and... But I can't go right back into the house, come back out with a bucket and say, well, where, where's all the stuff I just planted? Well, I, I'm, I'm ready to eat. I'm feeling hungry. Because there's a process and there's a patience that's going to be required. It's going to take some time to see the fruit of that labor. And that's going to be true for goodness. You're not going to, often there's not a direct cause effect where you just feel it immediately. You experience immediate gratification that I did something and as a result, I see the fruit of my labors. It's a journey. But you don't give up, even when you're dealing with difficult people, difficult circumstances. And if you'll stay with it, if you won't give up, there's a spiritual harvest awaiting. There'll be a reaping that will come. Third thing, from what Paul says in Galatians 6, is that goodness is for everyone. It's not just for people I like. Not just people who are easy to love. Not just for my friends or my family. The Bible says the Lord is good. This, again, we're, we're trying to mirror the heart of God. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The fruit of the Spirit is a reflection of the character of God, and Paul says, do good to everyone. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he taught this. You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And most of us go, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. He says, but I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You can't cherry pick this and say easy to love, hard to love. Ah, hard to love is too hard. I'll just do the easy stuff. He says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You reach out to the people nobody else cares about. The people that everyone else steps past because it's going to take too much investment. You stop right there and you jump in. You get in the game. And this is one of those times when the fruit of the Spirit is so countercultural. Because the culture says, love people like me. Hate people who are different than me. Love people who are easy to love. Just walk on past people who are hard to love. Can do it in a few moments and then check the box and it's all good going to be a long-term investment i can pass that one by we love everyone and we do good and it's a huge part of christian testimony because when others just pass by i like the story of the good samaritan when you stop and you dig in that's when goodness is elevated and people notice it that it's different from the rest of the world and it points to jesus Fourth, goodness is especially intended for other believers. And this is important. Paul says, especially, if you're doing good, especially the household of faith. So here we are. We live in the sinful world, and we live among sinful people. But I would pray that as a church, we'd certainly do good for one another. Remember, one of our ongoing things that we, a touchstone for us, that we go back to over and over and over again, because it's core to who we are as a church, Jesus said, by this day, people outside these walls will know that, that you, people inside these walls, are my disciples, if you love one another. That are you doing good for one another inside here? Because the people out there, they're really not worried about, is, is that message they're teaching in there true? Here's what they want to know. They want to know if it works. And how do you know if it works? You know it works because the people in here are loving one another. 
and caring for one another. This ought to be a refuge. It ought to be a place of blessing and encouragement. And we should do this for one another because it's one of our biggest testimonies to people outside these walls. Do good to and for one another. Because the goodness of our Lord, we practice goodness. One of my favorite guys in the Bible is a guy named Titus. And he's a lieutenant and kind of working under Paul's leadership, Apostle Paul's leadership. And Titus, he has, Paul always gives him rotten jobs to do. He's like a crisis intervention specialist. When there's a problem, he says, uh, Titus, uh, I think I made some people mad in Corinth. Could you go take care of that? And so he goes in not knowing exactly what he's going to run into. But he's a good, good man. And the Bible says, Titus 3, it says, let our people, this Paul, Paul writing to Titus, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help in cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. The essence is the final word for faithful friends is love. And love engages in pressing needs. And it engages in good deeds. and engages in goodness to one another. Paul sent Titus to Corinth. And in Corinth, uh, Titus wasn't sure what he was going to run into. And, but he gets there. And these are people that have been difficult but Paul doesn't give up on them, and Titus doesn't give up on them, and they continue to do good and continue to demonstrate the goodness of, of Christ and how they care for them, and here's what happens as a result. Therefore, we are comforted, Paul says, as he writes to the Corinthians. Besides our, our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. In my journey with the Lord, there have been so many times I can mark in the years I have been here, so many times when it was hard, when life was hard, when, when I was discouraged, that gathering together with people here just refreshed my spirit, put a new wind in my sails. And I'll be forever grateful for all the times that has taken place. Many of you have testimonies like that, that when it was darkest and when it was hardest, how, how God's people here cared for you and they demonstrate it with goodness. One last thought. Goodness won't get you to heaven. It's just not going to get you to heaven. When, if, you, if you ask people in Collin County, hey, so how are you planning to get to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven, plans to get to heaven. How are you planning to get to heaven when you die? And, they, and the answer, overwhelmingly, is going to be some version of be good, do good. I'm going to be a good person. And sometimes I'm going to do good things, and we're doing enough good things. It's, the scales are going to weigh slightly in my favor, so that at the end of, at the end of my days, if it's slightly fifty one percent of the good, I'm going to go to heaven. But we don't have the capacity for perfect goodness, and that's what God's looking for: perfection. So we're going to have to depend on the goodness of someone who's better at it than that we are, and that's why we put our faith in Jesus. He's our only hope. Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. Jesus who was raised from the dead. And as we surrender our lives to him, we have hope that we will not stay separated from God. But we'll have a relationship to God. And we can have assurance of, of God working in our lives, the Holy Spirit residing in us to help us accomplish everything God intends for his perfect plan for our lives. And no one of these days we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. The only good thing you need to do it's just to say yes to Jesus. And today, I mean, out of all things you could do today, today, if you have never settled that, if you've been, well, I'm on the self-improvement plan, I'm on the climb the ladder plan, I'm on the do good plan. It has never been a time in your life where you said, I can't be good. God, I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't fix it myself. I'm putting all my faith in what Jesus did because he did it to perfection. He died on the cross to pay for my sin, and he could because he was God and he was perfect. And I believe he was raised from the dead to demonstrate he was God. And I want to surrender my whole life to him. I want him to be the king, the Lord, the master, the leader of my life going forward. I want him to be the, the one who directs my life. And when you make that kind of commitment, just trust in him. The Bible says he's waiting for you with open arms to welcome you to his family. Today, give your life to Jesus Christ. There are a lot of things we can do to, 
to just take a step forward in what is possible in goodness. And that first step, give your life to Jesus. Here's another one, baptism. Baptism is a step of obedience to say, he's the king, he's the leader, he's the master. And he said that once I've given my life to him, this is, a, this is on the front end of steps I'm supposed to take. I, I want to be baptized. A little while ago, we baptized several, several folks, different ages, adults, kids. But at the end of the last hour, I said, if, if you've never taken that baptism step, we can put you in a change of clothes over there and we can do that today. We had an adult man who came up to me at the end of the hour and walked out of here with me. He said, I've given my life to Christ, but this I need to do. And he's baptized. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If you need to take that step, I'll suit up again. I still have my clothes out there. And the baptistry is still full. And uh, we can fix you up, set you up to go out here and declare, I belong to Jesus through baptism. Maybe it's church membership and church commitment that's your next step. That first steps class that's mentioned in the program, that's a great way to connect and to, again, not more than some people date church for a long time, but boy, be a part of the family is a commitment. And we'll talk about what that commitment looks like and and how you do that at the first steps class. And I want to encourage you, whatever your background, if you've been a, in a Baptist church your whole life, or this is the first Baptist church you've ever stepped into, come to that class and we'll answer a lot of questions. I'll be teaching it. It doesn't take real long, but it's a, it's a good experience. Here's, here's another goodness to get beyond yourself. What about service? My biggest growth steps have been serving God, finding a place to serve what if you said, yeah, I love my friends in my adult class, but I need to invest in the next generation. I, I feel it. I see the needs. I want to I wanna serve in preschool. I want to serve in children's ministry. I want to serve in student ministry. It, and we have so many different things going on in, in our church life where you can, you can say, I'm investing beyond myself. I'm investing in others. I'm going to demonstrate the goodness of God. And if you want to do that, see me at the Connection Center. It's just down here and a little bit to the right. It has the tall tables and chairs. I'll be over there. Other members of our staff will be there. And just say, sign me up for something. Or let me talk to somebody about what it's going to involve, what it's going to look like. But get involved in service. Maybe it's taking a step of faith. It's going to push you beyond, maybe again, where you've been before. And... Uh, You'd, uh, you'd take a big step of faith and say, I'm going to trust that I could go to Kenya with Chad in February and he could bring me home alive. That's a, that's a step of faith. that you, so I think he might get me home again. What we're going to do is harvest evangelism. We're just going out to share the gospel with people. Man, if I can do it in that context, uh, as uh, dumb American as I am, anybody can. So, Come to the meeting and say, I'm going to take a step into a place I, I never imagined before. Well, we make it so attainable, so doable in the life of our church because of the generosity of our people. Financially, if you'll take the time, we'll make it possible financially. Be a part of a next step with God today. Be a part of stepping beyond where you've been. And to, to not, just, not just, I'm going to try to be a good person, but that goodness would be overflowing out of your life in ways that are going to touch, touch people in your family, touch people in your church, touch people in the community, touch people to the ends of the earth. Because that's what goodness does is it, as it spills over as a fruit of the Spirit.